So I'm Gustav Nisone. It's a pleasure to talk about open data in the neuroimaging today. I thought uh, since uh, we're not that many, that we try and do it uh, rather conversationally. Uh, I'm going to give a more formal uh, version of this talk on Wednesday at uh, 10 to 12, uh, in case you're interested. Uh, so we'll talk first about uh, why, what are the reasons uh, for publishing and using open data in neuroimaging, and then we'll spend most of the time on uh, how, uh, what are the principles to think about uh, when uh, publishing and using uh, neuroimaging data, what are the ethics, and uh, so on. So <clears throat> the reasons for open data in neuroimaging are, uh, as far as I can see, the same uh, as for open data in science uh, in general. Um, what do you think? I mean, uh, let me ask you uh, uh, to get a feel of, uh, uh, of the room. How many of you have ever published open data uh, at all in any kind of research? Uh, one fourth. <laughs> Uh, and how many have published open neuroimaging data? Uh, zero. All right. Uh, so there's some experience with publishing open data uh, in the room. Uh, what um, uh, what proportion have ever uh, attempted to use openly published neuroimaging data? We have one project on that uh, today. All right. Still about one fourth. Uh, to your mind, what what are the most salient reasons for publishing open data? Oh. <laughs> you can use it again, and uh, there is less waste of research money and researchers' time. Yeah, it has a reuse potential, uh, presumably. Uh, Someone else can reproduce the results. Yeah, so that about covers it, I think. <clears throat> Data have reused potential, and that uh, is something that I like to split into two uh, subcategories. Uh, one is that when we try to estimate an effect, uh, we ideally want to base our estimate uh, on all the available data. Uh, so if we try to uh, to understand what the effect of X is on Y, then, then ideally we would want to take all the experiments where this has been tested, and we want, would want to factor them in to an assessment or a judgment of how this, uh, how the evidence uh, looks for this effect. And uh, the only way we can do that is if the uh, results are reported and preferably the data are available. A lot of the time, if we try to do this formally by means of a meta-analysis, it can happen that um, uh, people have done different things. Uh, and uh, in a meta-analysis, we need to uh, try to manage that heterogeneity that comes from experiments having been run in, in different ways uh, on different participants at different times and so on. And if all the data are available, then it's often possible to model different covariates. And then we can manage uh, differences between groups that might be due to characteristics of the participants, such as their age uh, or sex or other things. So open data allows us to deal with heterogeneity when, uh, when we try to reuse uh, data to understand uh, an effect. Uh, it also reduces the risk of bias. So again, if we, if we try formally to uh, put data together and understand an effect, uh, we are always limited by the risk of bias due to data not being accessible. And furthermore, the risk that the data are inaccessible for some uh, systematic reason. For example, people not publishing data when they don't show the results that they wanted. So if I have an experiment with um, a certain number of data points, uh, I have to interpret those results uh, in light of uh, all the data that might exist that I don't know about, uh, 
I, may, I may not know whether it exists, or I may know that it exists, but I may not be able to appraise it. That causes a bias. So you might say that the effects that I can observe in the data that I have at hand are influenced by uh, the data that exists in a drawer somewhere in, in different places. The data that are inaccessible project uncertainty onto the data that we can access and use. And the, and the only way to manage that bias is to try to bring as much data as possible out from uh, the drawers and into the lights. If we can estimate how much data there is, that helps. And if we can access it, then we can uh, reduce the bias. Uh, I have an example uh, that I'm working on right now. It's the effect of sleep deprivation on resting state uh, functional connectivity. We've done an experiment with about 80 participants. And uh, there have been other reports in the last five to 10 years. Uh, there are 15 to 20 reports out there and a total of about 400 participants reported, and an unknown number of experiments not reported. Uh, this literature is, uh, is uh, not very consistent. Uh, people have used different uh, measures of resting state uh, connectivity, and they have found different results. And uh, so taken as a whole, this published literature uh, is uh, rather hard to interpret. And uh, I think that is largely because many of the experiments are quite small and there are so many different outcomes that people have looked at that, um, that there may be a bias in the reporting. Now, in order to understand what, what effects are really there, uh, this is, uh, the, the present state of affairs is clearly somewhat unsatisfactory. Uh, we would have to do a very large experiment, I think, uh, to get solid evidence. But even if we did, a large experiment with, uh, let's say, 400 participants again, roughly the same number that has been reported. Uh, that would go a long way, but it would still be affected by bias uh, from all the experiments that have been performed, but from which we cannot access the data. So uh, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of inference, ideally speaking, uh, the only really good solution would be to bring out uh, all the data that already exists so that we could uh, put them all together and, uh, and see what we can find. And this would, of course, also represent a, an economical use of resources. We wouldn't have to do another big experiment and we wouldn't have to expose more participants to uh, uh, risks, even though the risks of MRI scanning are quite small. Uh, so that's one reason to publish open data. Um, incidentally, among these papers, I've uh, reviewed them quite closely. Uh, not one of them uh, has open data uh, published. One of them uh, is reported in a journal that has an open data policy, and it uh, has a uh, an accession number to a data repository, uh, but uh, there is nothing uh, there, unfortunately, which illustrates that policies uh, um, uh, can have varying uh, levels of, of follow-up to actually ensure that they're followed. All right, so uh, uh, usefulness for inference, as it were, uh, and re reduction of bias uh, is one reason for publishing open data. Another one which is still uh, in uh, the broad category of data being useful is that you might use the data to look at something else that's interesting. Um, does it happen often to you that you have a scientific question? And it's clear that someone else has already gathered the data that could be used to answer it. Have you experienced that? I can see a lot of nodding going on. Yes, I have experienced it too. Uh, I have another example there. Uh, last year we published a meta-analysis of the diurnal variation of interleukin-6 in the blood. And I'll not go into any of the details about that except to say that uh, there have been many studies where people have measured interleukin-6 in the same people several times in the course of the day. And uh, a lot of them were not primarily interested in diurnal variations. But when we are interested in diurnal variations, those data are very useful. And in some cases, we were able to access them and uh, use them again. And uh, that uh, helps uh, a lot. And, and I personally think it's very hard to predict what someone else might want to uh, use your data for. 
I think there's always value uh, in uh, the data that you uh, that you haven't. Um, um, and it's, it's very rare that you extract all of the potential uh, value from data. Uh, and so that's another reason it publishes. Uh, and a third reason, uh, as uh, Anders mentioned, is that it, it helps uh, someone else verify that uh, your results are correct. Uh, of course, there are always errors in anything uh, if you look hard enough, uh, but um, uh, the, um, the publication of open data allows us to, to find those errors more quickly, I think, uh, speaking in our, uh, about research uh, aggregatedly. Uh, if I've made errors, uh, and I certainly have, then I'm happier if they're spotted uh, by someone than if I continue to believe something that's not uh, quite right. And um, maybe more importantly, I think publishing open data helps uh, prevent errors in the first place. A lot of uh, things can be caught if you carefully prepare uh, the data for publication. Uh, I've spotted a number of uh, inconsistencies in my own work uh, when I've been um, preparing data for publication, and that has helped me to uh, avoid embarrassing mistakes. Uh, there's also, yeah. Can you give an example of that kind of thing? Well, uh, uh, for instance, uh, only uh, the day before yesterday, uh, I had uh, a data set uh, that I was uh, reanalyzing. And, uh, I'd already uh, submitted it to the journal and I'd put the data up and then I made some revisions. And then I noticed that there was uh, one column that was supposed to be data from the putamen, but I had accidentally put in hippocampus uh, twice. Uh, and I uh, only noticed this uh, uh, after the data <laughs> were actually uh, published, but it was in the round of revisions, so uh, we were able to uh, catch it uh, before it was too late. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that happens to me all the time. I think I'm perhaps more error prone than many other colleagues. I don't know, but <laughs> it, it helps. Uh, many of you will have noticed that there's a lot of debate in social media about uh, research uh, um, misconduct uh, and uh, uh, to my mind, a lot of those cases could have been prevented as well by publishing data openly. So that can really help uh, help uh, uh, to avoid embarrassing situations. Even in um, collective efforts, sometimes this is still errors. So it's kind of good that they are out there and you can reduce them. Indeed, there will be errors. Uh, I'm reminded of my old uh, supervisor who was in charge of the cervical cancer screening program uh, in the Stockholm County Council. Uh, once a year, there would be a quality review meeting uh, where they looked at all the misdiagnoses from the past year. And his stroke of genius was to always bring a cake to that meeting uh, to celebrate the high quality rather than to uh, feel uh, bad about the mistakes rather perhaps to celebrate the continuous uh, work to improve quality. All right, uh, I think those are the main reasons to publish open data. Uh, you might also uh, think that it's uh, important for one uh, other reason, which is that uh, a lot of people are starting to require it. Journal policies are starting to require it. The Swedish uh, Research Council uh, is uh, taking the view that open data is a good thing and they will not start to require it uh, very soon, but they will start very soon to require data management plans when you submit applications. And then it helps uh, to know uh, what strategies you can use uh, to describe how you're going to publish your data. So, uh, what are the principles to think about when you want to publish data openly? Uh, there are some different guidelines uh, uh, that it's possible to look at. One is the FAIR guidelines uh, that suggests that data should be findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and uh, reusable. Uh, these guidelines put a lot of focus on uh, appropriate metadata so people can, can find the data and understand uh, what they are. Field-specific guidelines may be uh, 
very helpful, and perhaps in the case of neural imaging data, more helpful. Um, I would like actually to uh, take as a starting point uh, another set of guidelines, which is uh, that of the um, open data badges. They are maintained by the Center for Open Science and uh, have been adopted by, uh, I think, around 20 scientific journals. The badges are little things that uh, that are put uh, on the scientific paper if it fulfills certain criteria for openness. Uh, so you can have an open data badge or an open materials badge or a badge for pre-registration. And uh, I like these criteria, um, partly because I was uh, involved a bit in defining them and um, there were a lot of useful discussions. So to earn the open data badge, uh, there are a few things uh, that you need to do. First of all, you need to publish the data uh, in a in an open repository, a repository that has uh, open access to the data, and uh, the the repository must uh, allow uh, for the data to be archived in a way that is uh, time stamped, immutable, and uh, permanent. Now we chose that to be a a best practice. The purpose of these badges is to describe practices that are uh, worth striving for, rather than to describe the practices that exist in the field today, uh, so as to have a, an incentive. And we consider different ways to publish data openly. You might put the data up on your own server, on the department server. You might put it in a, a supplement to a scientific paper. In some cases, you can publish the data in the paper itself, which is not a bad method if it's a small data set that fits in a table. Yeah, but that's the exception in our field. Uh, so uh, the use of a, of a repository uh, ensures that there is someone who takes responsibility for making the data available in the long term. Uh, if you put it on your own website, uh, then you have to maintain it, and that's quite hard in the long run. Uh, the data should be timestamped, immutable, and permanent. And I think uh, it's probably obvious to you why these are uh, desirable qualities. Uh, then you can go back and check uh, the data as they were in the point of time when they were used to make a certain inference uh, that someone is putting forward in the literature. And of course, if the data are permanent, then they will not be lost. Where do you find a good repository for your data? Have you tried? Does anyone have a, a preferred method? Um, I have a good experience with Abide, for example. I'm with sorry, with? Abide or Abide. Abide. Which is a very good effort of multi-center uh, about the freedom they have, all the fancy big data, mm. and they have a quality control, and this is huge. It's kind of really, really helpful. Um, because they're, they're, they've been reviewing all the data, mm. even if there's from different centers and everything. Uh, uh, please remind me what the ABIDE acronym stands for. Um, it's, a, it's basically from autism. I don't actually remember. Is it the... Uh... Um, Autism brain is something data exchange. It's possible. possible yeah. Yeah. All right. That's not the most important uh, thing uh, to sort out at this moment. But I think uh, I think that's an, a very good example of a highly specific uh, repository uh, uh, that uh, is doing well. How did you find that uh, uh, that repository? Uh, we're involving a project on. Uh, we wanted to have a good amount of data and hmm. the quality control is really good as well. We did a good, good job. How does that work? Do they have a data curator uh, that uh, goes yeah. through all the data? Yeah, so they're developers to, to look through that and see the cloud process and then different steps and can access actually from different parts of the process if you want. And you have the anatomical, you have the fMRI as well. Hmm. That's very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
my impression from looking at uh, things like poster sessions in conferences is that this is a resource that is uh, being uh, well used and that is uh, helping a lot of uh, our colleagues. Uh, more generally, if you want to find uh, a, a repository, uh, I can recommend, uh, uh, for example, the, rec the list of uh, repositories that is recommended by the journal uh, Scientific Data. Uh, there are a number of general repositories as well as field-specific repositories uh, listed there. Uh, I suggest if you have field-specific data that you use a field-specific repository uh, because uh, then uh, you will not have to make so many difficult decisions on your own about formatting. <coughs> uh, I'm uh, uh, starting a collaboration with the people behind the Open fMRI database, which uh, I personally uh, like and which I'm happy to recommend. This is a database uh, that, contrary to its name, does not only take fMRI data, it takes uh, any kind of structural and functional uh, neuroimaging data uh, from humans. Uh, I don't know if they also are interested in other kinds of data. I believe they're planning to change the name to reflect uh, this uh, uh, broader scope. Um, since I'm uh, starting a collaboration with uh, uh, with the, the keepers of this database, uh, I thought I'd uh, try to help anyone who has a data set that they would like to publish there. I would be very happy to uh, uh, be a link between you and your data and uh, the uh, uh, repository. The OpenFMRI database also uh, has a, a high degree of professional support with it as curators that help to take your data and put it into the desired format in which they're going to publish it, uh, which is the uh, Brain Imaging Data Specification uh, BIDS format. And uh, uh, I'll leave it to Anders to say more about that in the next uh, talk. And this is a structured format that helps uh, facilitate a reuse. Um, You can publish uh, fMRI data in, in field general repositories as well and in a less structured format, but I would not uh, recommend that. Uh, I, can, uh, um, I can mention uh, uh, one, one recent experience that I had when I was a reviewer for uh, the journal PLOS One, which has uh, a rather strong policy these days, saying that the data should be openly published. I was a reviewer for an fMRI experiment, and uh, the authors uh, uh, said that they uh, had followed this policy, and they pointed to uh, publication on uh, the FIGTRA repository. Uh, and what they had published there was the final T-maps uh, that was um, behind their figures that they had published. And uh, so uh, I looked at that, and. Uh, and the uh, the maps were uh, were fine. They were accessible. I could uh, download them. I could use them. Uh, but importantly, uh, the final T maps are not the data that are used to arrive at the results. And uh, so, uh, what does it mean to demand that data are published openly? This is perhaps uh, still not a completely settled question in every place that has an open data policy. What I suggested in this case was that uh, they should put uh, the uh, raw data uh, up in a suitable repository, because that's uh, what we need in order to reproduce uh, the findings that are in the final P maps. Um, Thank you for that question raw data or pre-processed data. Uh, that's another point that I wanted to make, actually. Uh, not least with neuroimaging data, we have many processing stages. 
and uh, it's uh, probably going to differ between uh, what you want to use the data for, uh, which the stage of processing is most valuable. But if you put the rawest possible format out there, then it will be possible to reconstruct uh, the processed uh, stages. So that is, uh, in most cases, the most valuable, uh, the, the way to preserve most of the value in the data. Uh, it has happened uh, repeatedly in the uh, last uh, uh, 20 to 30 years in our field that people have come up with better methods for pre-processing. Uh, of uh, fMRI data as well as PET data and uh, other data. And uh, uh, it can be really interesting in some cases to go back to old data and, uh, and uh, do the pre-processing again. Uh, my recommendation and the recommendation of the Open Data Badge is to put up the data in the rawest possible format. Uh, but, so just a question because in fMRI you generally put up the NIFTY file and put the icon. Is there a reason why? Because I mean, there's at least one sample pattern. Uh, yeah. So is there a reason why in fMRI we decided Nifty not DICOM? Is there a reason in fMRI why we decided to put up Nifty files and not DICOM files? Um, I couldn't say really. Uh, I, it's uh, appropriate to uh, uh, archive DICOM files. Uh, I'm not sure whether any information is really lost in the transformation to nifty files. Uh, that's a technical question that is beyond me. Uh, probably most or nearly all of the information, or maybe even all of the information is retained. Most. I think that this is why. Oh. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to repeat some of that uh, for the benefit of anyone who's uh, trying to listen. Uh, so uh, it was pointed out that uh, that the DICOM headers might contain uh, information that is identifying and uh, that it would not be retained after conversion to Nifty. Um, right, this brings us uh, to uh, the question of, um, uh, of, of uh, de-identifying uh, participants' data uh, and uh, to ethics uh, more generally. And what I'd like to point to here is the uh, the general principle that we have to weigh the uh, benefits versus the risks and harms. So what we like to think is that the participants uh, agree to participate in, in our research because of the benefits uh, in terms of, of uh, knowledge gain. That's why they undertake risks and harms. Uh, this may be uh, invasive procedures in some types of uh, brain imaging. It may be uh, risks of incidental findings. It may be risks of uh, pain and discomfort uh, during scanning, uh, and it may also be risks uh, that the data uh, uh, are um, uh, somehow uh, to the detriment of the participant uh, in the end. This is a risk that exists and that we have to uh, consider. This has to be outweighed by the benefits uh, consisting of, of knowledge gain primarily. So our responsibility to the participants is to uh, bring out as much as possible of the benefits. And we can do that by publishing data openly. So uh, one uh, very important point here that I'd like to make uh, is that when you consider uh, 
whether to publish data from humans, uh, you don't just have to think about the risks involved. You also have to, to weigh that against the benefits. And I think sometimes we see an overly legalistic perspective uh, from some of our uh, governmental agencies that tend to weigh the risks only and not the benefits. But what we want is to weigh the balance. Um, so we don't want uh, identifiable data uh, to rather we don't want we don't want data from human participants to be identified when we have published it openly. Uh, we want to prepare the data in such a manner that you can't find out who is who. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's some, something that you can think about uh, in a structured way, uh, if you want. Uh, you have uh, you have a, a population that is the target population if you're trying to identify someone. Uh, the target population that's the participants that you've had in your experiment. Then there's a reference population that is usually bigger. Uh, that is uh, uh, the population that you're trying to match against. The reference population might be, for instance, the whole population of a country. Now, in order to have a successful matching, then a participant needs to be uh, unique in both the uh, target population and the reference population. Uh, if they are unique on some set of variables, then you can have a perfect match. If they are not unique, then you can still have a match with some degree of probability. This kind of reasoning is perhaps most applicable to uh, registries and population-based studies where you have information such as people's uh, age and sex and uh, area of residence and maybe occupation. Uh, and then with a, a number of variables like that, you will eventually uh, be able to make a matching. To reduce that risk, uh, we can take out variables that are uh, unique. If we have variables in our data set uh, about, for instance, uh, participants' age or their biometric measures such as their height uh, or weight, uh, and they are unique, these values are unique in the data set, then we can censor those columns. Or we can categorize them. We can lump the, the participants into age categories of uh, 10, 10 year bins, for instance. This will help against uh, uh, having unique um, sets of um, uh, uh, data points between uh, columns uh, in our data set. But sometimes we can't uh, uh, completely do that. And of course, in brain imaging, uh, we need to have a picture of the brain. If we don't have a picture of the brain, then uh, we, we really don't have much data left to work with. Uh, and uh, uh, the brain uh, has uh, uh, a unique uh, trait uh, for each person. So how can we manage that? Well. Uh, we have now to uh, weigh benefits against risks. We can reduce the risks by taking out information that is not pertinent to the brain. What the open fMRI data set, uh, database does is to cut off the face region of the head. This means that if you try to match uh, a data point to a reference uh, population where you have information about someone's face, that will not be possible. But if you attempt matching to a reference population where you have a high resolution uh, anatomical scan of the same person uh, that is not too far off in time, uh, then there is a risk that you will be able to do uh, a, a matching. So then you have to assess the risk that someone will be able to do that. Uh, then they have to know that the, the person they're looking for they have to know to combine two data sets uh, that has the identifying data. And we also need to consider the risks uh, that happen if identification is successful. 
So the risk of re-identification from an anatomical MR image is probably quite low. Uh, the reason being that um, in order to know if a participant is in the reference population, uh, then you probably need to have some kind of insider uh, in within healthcare or within another research project that uh, that uh, suspects that the participant exists in both datasets and is able to do a matching. Uh, it's not possible generally to obtain uh, an MR image of a human without uh, their knowledge, uh, which also limits uh, the future risks. Now, this, uh, this level of risk that we're left with might be unacceptable if we have some very sensitive data about the person in the data set, but it might be acceptable if we uh, don't have uh, very sensitive uh, data in the data set. So that's uh, the next variable to consider. What is sensitive about the information that exists in the data set? Typically, uh, uh, sensitive variables are such uh, uh, variables as, for example, information about the participant's health uh, status, which is quite common in our uh, medical university. But it could also be something like information about their uh, uh, sexual orientation uh, or uh, about their private affairs uh, one way or another. So another way to protect the data is to remove the variables that are sensitive and not publish those. Now you can think about different threat models. Uh, who is it that is going to do this matching and how likely is that? Uh, most of the time when I try to do that I arrive at the conclusion that the uh, most dangerous threat models are either an insider uh, or that the participant themselves uh, tries to re-identify themselves in the data set. And in this later case, the problem is not that bad because they have a right to know anyway uh, if they ask. The data that we've gathered on our participants is owned by the university. The university is the Forschungshuvudman uh, the responsible party that runs the research project. This means that the information about the participants is uh, uh, Allman handling. Uh, it's, um, it's something that anyone can ask to see and we have to show it to them, except for sensitive information. So uh, we don't own the data ourselves. Uh, and um, uh, as the law now stands, uh, we can't make sweeping promises to our participants that we won't uh, uh, give anyone the data. Uh, we, and uh, that's uh, something that not everyone knows. There are examples of uh, consent forms that, that say things like uh, no one outside the project is going to see these data. And that's a promise that we can't make. Do you do a different ethical application for this? Do you have to give everything very detailed to the ethical board before you run the study? Yes. So, uh, the Ethics Review Board uh, application uh, is, uh, is what gives us um, um, Okay, I'll put it this way. Uh, whether or not you write in the application that are going to publish data openly, they are still uh, public documents except for sensitive uh, information. This means that uh, it's typically not uh, a hindrance if you want to publish data that are already collected. It's typically not a hindrance if you don't, if you haven't mentioned that to the Ethics Review Board. Uh, you can, if you want, make uh, an amendment to your application to really cover your uh, uh, yourself. But the Ethics Review Board uh, uh, is not the main uh, uh, thing, in my opinion. It's the consent by the participants. Uh, that's really the important thing here. If it's a private research institution, it's not run by the government. If it's a private research institute, uh, then uh, typically they own the data. But then it's not open to the Then it's not necessarily open to the public, indeed. Yeah, uh, so we want to respect the participants' autonomy and therefore we want them to know exactly what it is they consent to. Uh, 
and therefore we want to tell them that we are going to publish their data openly. We also want to protect their integrity and therefore it's good if they know what information uh, is uh, going to be in a data set so that they themselves can assess the risks uh, and um, uh, and, they, and it might, at least in theory, inform their future behavior. For instance, the decision of whether to undergo another MRI scan, if they know that one MRI scan of their head has been published. Uh, there are some good examples of language to use in consent forms in English. Uh, uh, there's no example in Swedish, but I'm working on uh, uh, trying to put that together with the help of some people at the Department of Medical Ethics here and uh, a, a skilled uh, jurist who works with open data. Uh, eventually, <laughs> when, uh, when we have something, something to show for, we will uh, put that up online. Um, all right. Um, So um, this is all to say that the best thing we can do for our participants is to bring out the, the, the most value. And uh, uh, we usually do that by publishing as much as we can from the data set without, uh, uh, while, while keeping the risk of the accidental uh, re-identification as low as we can. Uh, my experience is that you can identify uh, sorry, you can you can de-identify a data set very aggressively and still have data left that are uh, valuable. For instance, I mentioned last year we did the, a meta-analysis of interleukin-6 in the blood. And one of the questions that faced us was, uh, is this variable exponentially distributed? More or less. Because if it is, then we want to log transform it. And it looked like it was. So we did. But it would have been better if we could have based that on some independent data. And all we would have needed would, in that case, have been uh, the data themselves, one column of data points with no uh, relation to anything else. So a, a data set of that kind could have been de-identified to the point where nothing else is left except the variable of interest. And we would have still found that very valuable. Um, okay, uh, I think I've covered uh, the things that I wanted to say, and uh, so please consider it an an open invitation. If if you're thinking about publishing data, uh, come and talk to me. Uh, I'll see if I can be of any help, uh, and uh, uh, that would be fun. Uh, are there any thoughts or questions? I am. Um, so, firstly, uh, I agree with all the benefits of open data and so forth, but I always like to think of possible negatives. And there's this one negative that we've been kind of I've been concerned about for a while. So, forget the open data part, but you can you can imagine um, a professor with uh, a data set and has ten possible hypotheses on this data set, and will obviously have to correct for those hypotheses if he if he does know. Um, but instead gives out to 10 different PhD students and each one of those becomes their own analysis. So then you don't correct for it because the 10 publications come over the span of five, 10 years and people don't think they're connected in, in, this, in the same way. Isn't this a possible problem with open data that we have uh, too many false positives because there are just so many hypotheses thrown at the data? Yeah. Um... So the question is really, does open data lead to more uncontrolled data mining yeah. with, with poor inferences and false positives? And it might, but I think the answer is not to take away the data. Uh, the answer is to, to control the inferential process. I mean, I could, you, could, uh, you could use the same arguments uh, against any data, really. Why, why should scientists have data if they do exploratory analyses? Shouldn't we take away their data so they can't? <laughs> And that's not, but I mean, so what procedures, so don't we also need procedures to, it seems stupid to say, but to control for possible uh, multiple comparisons? Yeah. There is something called freedom of expression. 
Yes, but we can have 500 scientists all pre registered yeah. and hypothesis and something yeah, like that. At least we know that it's a scientist. It's right and finding Yes, but still, if, if 500 people pre registered the hypothesis, so isn't that still a problematic? Yeah. yeah, it is still problematic. Uh, I agree with you. That that's problem will not be solved by open data, but uh, I do agree with Anders that pre-registration goes a long way. And um, also, open data does increase the likelihood that you can do a confirmatory analysis on some other data set uh, that is out there, and I think that helps uh, too. Okay. I'm not sure though what the Pre-registered many attempts with the open source data set to analyze it. That's just equivalent of basically more people working on the same issues. And as long as we do it within a rigorous statistical framework where it's clear what we have done and where that's documented, I don't think that that becomes a problem for interpretation in the end. Well, it is for, for comparisons. I mean, if you're not correcting for this 500 level comparison between people building data. No, sure, but then that's up to the person who's interpreting all those results together to, to do that comparison internally. Right? As long as everything is on, on register, as long as we know what has been done, mm -hmm. then it's up to each researcher trying to integrate all work that has been done. And the problem with that though is we don't start getting, if we have to not do a multiple comparison correction for every single uh, pre-registered result from the on the data, there's going to be decay of possible inference on the data. Because let's say I just do a giant for loop on really, really, really bad hypothesis on some data set that I don't like for some reason. And I do one million, one million tests on that, pre-register them all, they're all incorrect. But now somebody then has to also correct for my million uh, hypothesis I've had in that data. So that means it's possible of actually getting a correct inference become decays if you actually try and take this into account. If you could do a person expert data analysis on the open data, then that would take away from it. When you know that we, you have a good uh, reason to find something, maybe. And then combine the data. Yeah. I think uh, we can use this to be done. But does that mean the only because that's I agree the value of open data can be a fixed order in first instance. If you want to not do an fixed order for the hypothesis driven analysis, how do you deal with multiple comparisons, either future multiple comparisons that people could do on this data set, or all the comparisons somebody else has done on this data set? I guess it's not that often to do a search and show that uh, these ten other labs have tried these. Uh, approaches on the same data and we repeat and uh, the first repetition is uh, up to arguing for a case. This is an interesting yeah. discussion. Uh, I would prefer not to cut it short, but it is time uh, for Anders uh, to uh, uh, have the floor. Uh, so let's move on uh, now to uh, uh, his uh, presentation. Thank you.